Welcome to Season 5, Episode 9 of Fire Away, Rudner Law's online show focused on the employment law issues that matter to you. My name is Stuart Rudner. I'm an employment lawyer and mediator, founder of Rudner Law, and your host of this episode of Fire Away. Just a reminder that Fire Away stream is live online every month, and if you missed an episode or want to watch one again, they're always available on our YouTube channel. Please subscribe, our Facebook page, and our website. So, topic for today... Bell Media, not that long ago, got a lot of attention with their handling of the termination of their anchor, Lisa Laflam, not the attention that they wanted. And so we're going to take that as an opportunity to look at that situation and some of the learn lessons that we can learn from that. And uh, generally speaking, how HR can interact with, uh, with PR occasionally, because although we usually think of HR matters as being private, there are times where they have to be addressed publicly. And it's important for employers and, and their lawyers to understand how to do that effectively, whether it's a high profile departure, filing of a wrongful dismissal claim or a human rights claim, allegations of harassment or, or discrimination, etc. The key is to understand how HR and PR can work together. So to help us with that, today I'm very excited to be joined by Eric Yeverbaum. Eric is the CEO of Erico Communications and a communications media and public relations expert with over 40 years in the industry and uh, some really interesting experience that I've learned about over the last few weeks. Eric is also the best-selling author uh, who literally wrote the book on public relations. He wrote the bestseller Public Relations for Dummies, as well as six other titles, including Leadership Secrets of the World's Most Successful CEOs. And as a, a quick aside, I have to say, as I was preparing for this this morning and, and reminding myself that uh, Eric, you wrote uh, Public Relations for Dummies. I, I flashed back to a comedian I saw on YouTube a few weeks ago who was talking about how when you go into the bookstore, you've got the dummies section and the complete idiots section, and they cover generally the same topics. So this comedian was talking about how, you know, in addition to everything else he's got to deal with in life, he's got to walk into a bookstore, find a book that helps him with whatever topic he wants to talk about, but he's got to decide whether he is a dummy or a complete idiot. So I always laugh when I when I see the complete idiot guides now or the dummies guides. Eric, thank you very much for joining me today. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, it's so great to be one of the dummies guys. <laughs> <laughs> when I wrote uh, that book, I thought, oh, this is so great. I wrote a book about my own industry. And then I sent it <laughs> to somebody that we were pitching, and they said, why'd you send me a book for dummies? I'm like, come on. <laughs> Got attention, which is the important thing, right? That's right. That's <laughs> right. So, Eric, I'll, I'll start at the very, very high-level question. Uh, when when should HR be working with PR? Well, actually, it, today, all the time. I mean, this, it, it's a new day. Social media is now part of every, you know, all walks of life. And it, much as corporate America may try to uh, police uh, employees, social media, uh, uh, you know, as we were talking before, I do the opposite. I tell my employees, you be yourself. I don't care who you are. I hired you for you. You don't have to pretend to be anybody else. If a client begs to differ with your you know, perspective, then, then we'll have a problem with the client, not with the employee. But it, it, that is not, generally speaking, the policy of m most companies. But all of that said, it, it, it's not controllable. So you know, I'd strongly encourage HR departments to be integrating and talking to their PR people on a regular basis because you're going to have situations happen now like you would not have just a few years ago. Yeah, no, look, obviously, you know, we, we deal with this and we've talked about this on this show before, you know, people who post things online and they may have nothing to do with their job, nothing to do with the company they work for, but for whatever reason, it's offensive or inappropriate and it ties them back to the company they work for. And all of a sudden the question is, can we fire them? You know, that's a question we usually get. And, and of course the answer always is it depends. Um, but we're seeing a lot more of this where people post really dumb stuff and they end up losing their job and then they cry freedom of speech and, and don't understand that there can be consequences for their actions. Um, so I want to flip over to uh, the Lisa Laflamme story. And, uh, you know, this you know, it's, it's interesting that it's a media company uh, who should be used to planning for these things and just seems to have handled it so badly. So. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll let you take over. What, what were all the red flags you saw as this story unfolded? Well, I mean, just out of the gate, for starters, it's not that they handled it badly. Uh, they didn't handle it at all. I mean, they uh, I, I think they invented the plan for communication on the fly. I, I, I don't know how else to say it. No disrespect to 
any friends I might have there. But <laughs> you need it. You especially if you, I mean, your television network. And you handle it like that. That was so flat footed. I cannot even tell you. Not only was it flat footed, but which it just was. I don't even like I, I don't like to say that, but it was there was no thought, no forethought, no plan in place. Uh, Elizabeth Dole taught me when I was a kid, the worst time to prepare for a crisis is when the tide is rising. So my entire career, this is how I've counseled, you know, corporate America. You need a plan. And corporate America will say back to me, well, that the plan's expensive. We'll deal with it when we have to. I say, that's not the time you want to deal with it. Trust me. It's almost like having insurance. You sound a lot like me because this is what I have. I have this conversation all the time. I say you want to plan for the termination or whatever else ahead of time. Um, you want to be strategic. And the answer I get is, costs a lot of money to meet with a lawyer and be strategic. So we're just going to see what happens and deal with that. So it costs a lot of money, but one bad second on social media spins all around the world. You can have the greatest lawyers in the world after that. You, you know, you, 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 you can't bring Pandora back into the box. Yeah. And in the case of, and, and that's what we got now. That's what we have. Everybody can be like when I was a kid, you know, I was on national television. That was a big deal. Anybody can be in broadcast now. Anybody and people are. You see all sorts of, you know, pop up stars and all sorts of <laughs> look, look podcasts that are, you know, they're viral. Uh, people are watching them all over the world. Anybody can now. It's not like you know the good old days when I was a kid. <laughs> but when if, if you see TV, you know, shame on you. You're a television <laughs> network. I mean, I gotta. I, we we've talked about this before. I'm watching, you know, broadcast news on Apple TV. No plug for them. I don't represent them. It, it, it's literally the CTV story. They did the same yeah. thing. It's a, it's a, it, they projected this storyline before this storyline happened. Yeah. And, it, and it's uh, like you said, I mean, it's, it's like insurance. You've stolen my line or I stole yours, perhaps. Uh, but yeah, like this was entirely foreseeable. This is one of the largest media outlets in our country with their national news anchor losing her job or, or being let go, I guess is a better way to put it. And there should have been clear a, a whole lot of planning. They should have realized this was going to be a major story. And yet they didn't seem to plan. So oh, it, let me ask you, let me ask you this way. If, if they had come to you and said, we're planning to let Lisa Laflamme go or not renew her contract, you know, what would the playbook have looked like? Oh, I, I mean, I would have sat down with Lisa long before that ever happened. I would have given Lisa the opportunity to, with dignity and grace and respect, a sign off in the way that she wanted to sign off. She might not have been happy, you know, I'm, I'm sure she wasn't happy about losing her job. It sounds to me like there was a lot of chaos behind the curtain, which we'll never know about one way or the other. And it's just, you know, he said, she said, but I never would have let her, I mean, a treasure in some ways uh, to, uh, to the country who's been watching her every single day um bold of her you know during a pandemic to say you know what gray hair is not so bad um uh, i became a national news story for it and you know endeared herself to people all over the world as a result to pull the plug the way that they did it's just it, it it's it didn't have to be that way it should never be that way there should be a different protocol um i believe uh, for people who uh, this woman was the face of an or one of the faces of that network for a very long time loved by viewers and not because i say so they kept her on the air all those years people loved her what were they thinking and <laughs> i i would have to guess they weren't thinking yeah no I think that, look i think that's the question everyone's asking is what were they thinking if they were at all and you made you know the point you made about you would have sat down and talked with her found a way to for her to exit with dignity which is and, and this is i think a big part of the problem ctv has that's exactly what they did with her predecessor who was an older gray gray-haired man right. that's so right now you've got all the allegations that not only was this a wrongful dismissal and a poorly executed dismissal there was discrimination and she was treated differently because she was a woman or she was an older woman and she had her gray hair um so clearly that's what should have happened and, and as you said you know pandora is now out of the box uh, but when this starts to fall apart, when she's taken off the air and the news stories start to run, you know, is there any way to, to come back and, and try to fix things? Well, uh, you know, <laughs> if you're not going to give a genuine, authentic apology that's real, that's from the heart, that you actually feel, 
uh, no. And mm -hmm. what they did was they gave uh, an apology. Again, I'm sorry, but I have a feeling that history will judge it that way, if not right exact now. It seemed very disingenuous to me. And uh, then you hear all the stories. Now, what are we to believe when we hear all the stories about what was going on behind the curtain? The thing is about the way that they put themselves in this position so that we have to say, hmm, what about all of those stories that were going on behind the curtain between senior people and on-air talent? Sounds, so, sounds real to me. <laughs> So one, one thing I found interesting now, because I was thinking about this as we were getting ready for this show, you know, obviously there was a whole lot of media attention when she was, when her contract wasn't renewed, a whole lot of controversy. It's quite a down uh, now. We don't really hear Lisa LaFlamme's name as often lately. She's actually on one of the radio stations in Toronto, she, well, or she was anyways, covering the, uh, the Queen, but uh, it's died down. At some point, do you think this is now going to become a story again? I mean, she... I don't know if she has. Well, I mean, that. if she wants it to be, it could be. Right. And, you know, look, look, look at, you know, just as an example, different set of circumstances. But, you know, what happened like with, you know, Gretchen Carlson at Fox, uh, there's a movie about that story. Okay. So it may have quieted down for a little while and then out comes the movie. Or out comes <laughs> other allegations. And when the other allegations start and when other situations begin, which I could predict with a reasonable degree of certainty they will and actually already have, then the story pops up again. So, you know, uh, uh, no, she's not, you know, the main story, but she's still, she's still, I would be, if I was CTV, I would be very concerned and I would make, I, I, I would somehow make that a better situation before the next round of allegations come. Uh, uh, which my understanding is they already are. Right. And yeah, I was, I was going to segue to that, but before I do, so what would you do? So now if the Lisa left Lamb story, it's quieted down, but it may come back, but you're also waiting for the more allegations to come out. If you're Bell Media, what do you do in the meantime? Well, it, you know, I'm, I'm not advising them. If I was, I would say you're always, there's always going to be more stories. It's not going to be the only one. I, I could have, I would have bet the farm on that. And lo and behold, it would have been a good bet. Yes. But the relationship that they have with her in real life, that's not, you know, in front of the camera, that's not played out in the news, is not good enough. Have a good relationship with her. Everybody there has jobs because of what she did. And everybody there should pay homage to that. And in, in any way, shape, and form that you possibly can, in real life, engage her. See what will actually make her happy. And by the way, she, I mean, her, um, everything that she stood for is heroic. Treat her that way. Yeah, that's that's the way you look good, as, as you all know. And so, as you've mentioned, there already is one more allegation, and, and it's a pretty serious one. It was just fairly recently where a longtime member of their uh, their media team resigned one day and then posted uh, I think it was one or possibly two videos the next day detailing all about the all of the discrimination that she alleges and of course there's still allegations but all the discrimination that she alleges that she suffered as a woman there and you know I've got one of the quotes in front of me it's, you know I gave I gave my everything to the company literally my blood my sweat and my tears and then she says that she was treated like a token and a commodity by CP24 and Bell passed over for promotions that her male colleagues would have received, et cetera, et cetera. So I guess here's, here's you know, there's a bunch of questions I could ask you, but I'll start with this one. We're now in the age of social media. She files a claim and then posts her videos online. So how do you fight back with these videos that are now going viral online? The thing is, it's about uh, my art, the art of public relations, information, dissemination, communication is you got to be real. It's not about like, you know, spin people coming in. Uh, uh, you have to practice what you preach in real life. And, you know, the 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 stories are believable, um, whether they're true or not. And there's two there's two courts. There's the real court and there's the court of public opinion. And if you're a television network, you live in the court of public opinion. Why would you not have thought of that? And you know, it, it, which, which leads me to questions of who, who was making those decisions without thinking, you know, we are a public treasure. We, we have fans. Our talent on 
intentionally. We do billboards with these people. We do commercials of these people. We rely on them to draw in, and then we just cut them off. So, so when you have a situation like this, where someone posts, you know, videos detailing discrimination, or it's just an online tweet, or whatever it is, where there are allegations. And I would say probably more often than not, the response that I see companies making is, oh, it's with the lawyers now and it's a legal matter. We don't discuss that, uh, which you know most lawyers will recommend. Uh, yeah, all lawyers will recommend that. I totally right. understand that. And the thing about it is, is, is that, uh, you know, us laymen who are watching TV or reading the news who see, you know, uh, on the advice of legal counsel, you know, I'm not commenting. Uh, I can tell you what us pedestrians think. We think you're guilty immediately. And of course, that's the advice of counsel. And I literally have sat in the middle of the, uh, all over simplified, the chairman, the lawyers, and me. Uh, the lawyers always want to, and justifiably so, I do understand the perspective. They don't want you to talk. Everything needs to go through them because at some point you're going to be in court. But the court of public opinion will judge you very differently for that. Mm -hmm. All right. And look, as you said before, you're dealing with two different courts or, or maybe two. I mean, look, the reality in, in Canada, and I think it's similar in the States, most cases never get to trial. Most cases get yeah. settled at some point. Uh, so you may or may not get to court, but you're always in the court of public opinion. So in many ways, that has to be your focus. And especially when... When you're already put into the public uh, focus, you got to respond. So I totally get that. I'm curious to get your thoughts because, you know, as I mentioned in the intro, you've been doing this for four decades now. Um, how much more important is it to address the court of public opinion now that we're in the world of social media? Um, you know, uh, I would look at that on a case by case basis. With CTV, I would say clearly, court of public opinion matters. And the thing about the court of public opinion, and any information dissemination or anything that's put out there is it's influential. It influences other organizations. So when people see what CTV, if they do the right thing, they do the right thing. Other companies will do the right thing. They do the wrong thing. Other companies will feel like they can get away with the wrong thing. I mean, come on already with it. It's great. Uh, personally, I don't know. Homage to the person who has experience. That's my opinion. Um, Homage to the person who's been on the air so long and so long enough to have gray hair. That's the person I want to listen to, actually. OK, let's say I'm biased because I'm an older demographic. Nevertheless, the notion that corporate America and they said one of my mentors said this to me, he said, Eric, you can love a good company. A good company will never love you back. And I thought, well, that's, are you kidding me? I love everybody that works for me. Yeah, I, I hope they love me back the same. It isn't the case in corporate America. Companies don't love their employees. They use their employees. And when, when you feel used, you know, you, you, you're you not going to give it your all. And in the case of CTV, this is in front of a curtain. How many yeah. viewers are they going to lose uh, as a result of this decision? Well, that's a really important point. It kind of gets, you know, closer to what I do on a day-to-day -day basis is, you know, I always tell clients, so you want to be an employer of choice. Uh, and you're not going to be an employer of choice when you do something like what happened in this case. Yes. Um, so that's that's another important consideration. So what I mean, and we're talking about you know CTV, who are they're a media company, but and any large company has their own PR department. But what would your advice be for for the smaller to mid-sized companies who don't have their in-house legal, probably don't have in-house HR, certainly don't have in-house you know PR. Uh, but if they either they suspect there's going to be um, a PR issue, or let's say there already is one. You know, let's say there's already been an allegation made. It's it's hit the uh, the media. You know, do you recommend they contact someone like you, or what should they do at that point? Um. Uh, well, it, it will probably help. <laughs> I won't plug myself, but it'll probably help. I would say the vast majority of uh, the clients my agency represents you haven't heard stories. Uh, like this in no small part because we're either prepared in advance and or pick and choose the good people because they're out there and that's who you want to work for the good people yeah that's that's what and, and by the way this whole notion of you know when it might happen i can tell you right now for everybody who listens to your show it's gonna happen <laughs> think about it it's gonna happen yep 
Uh, again, you sound like me. Whenever they say we've never been sued for wrongful dismissal, that's exactly what I say. It's going to happen. You may have been lucky so far. It's a matter of time. Um, and having an employment lawyer lined up, having a PR specialist lined up, these are all things that you need to have as part of uh, your team. Uh, Again, I'm just guessing. I'm, you know, I'm an outsider. I can only gauge by what I read. But in, in a situation like CTV, they're running around putting their finger in the dike all over the place to try to keep the water from coming in. Right. Which, which never works. Never. No. <laughs> all right. Uh, so I'm looking at, at the time, and as usual, it flies by. But before I uh, take my, my turn to fire away, uh, any, any last words? Uh, no. I, I, well, yes. I always have last words. I can talk forever, <laughs> but every, nobody wants me jumping around in my seat when I get excited about the topic. Um, I think we can tell you're excited. <laughs> prepare in advance. Prepare. This will inevitably happen to companies big and small. Social media has changed communications and what you think heretofore were private matters with inside a company. And besides preparing, treat your people right. It's that simple. Treat people how they want to be treated and you won't have these problems. I, I, I love it. I'm not sure I could have said that much better myself. Uh, Eric, it's obvious how passionate you are about this. And I got to give you credit. You didn't jump around too much. You managed to stay I tried. centered I, I, pretty I, I, well. I down in the chair. <laughs> and uh, next time we're going to tie you down. If we have you back, we'll, we'll send you uh, uh, Honestly, no. I'm intimidated by your producer. I keep looking <laughs> over and he's giving me the thumbs up and saying I did okay. I was worried he's going to jump through the screen and grab He's me. actually a really nice guy, but he, he, he's, <laughs> I'm sure he is. He, he knows I tend to lean towards the window. I'm kind of like a plant. Um, but anyways, we, you, obviously you're passionate about this. So thanks, thanks for joining us. It was a really uh, thank fun Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. And uh, I look forward to the next time. Thank and uh, now I'm going to take uh, my turn to fire away. Okay. So for, for this segment, I thought I would do a list of the top 10 termination mistakes that organizations make. So these aren't in any particular order, but I thought, I thought I'd start with a term that is trending you know, currently, which is quiet firing. So that's my number one. Quiet firing, and I will just say this, it is never a good plan to shut someone out and try to force them to quit rather than pay them the severance that you know they're entitled to. This is what we used to call a constructive dismissal, uh, but it almost never ends well, and it often ends with the company paying out a whole lot more than they would have if they just terminated the person and given them the severance. That's number one. Number two of the top termination mistakes, dismissing without understanding the severance obligations. You know, those of you who watch these, these shows regularly know there are way too many nuances, the myths, misconceptions. The worst thing you can do is make assumptions. It's not a month per year. Short-term employees can be entitled to significant severance. The worst thing you can do is make the assumption, go ahead and dismiss someone and then find out that you actually have to pay them a whole lot more than you anticipated. And you may have acted differently if you'd known. So make the decision after you have legal advice. At number three, or tip number three, acting in bad faith. Those who watch this regularly know there is a duty of good faith in the course of dismissal. And good faith includes things like being honest and treating the employee respectively. So one of the most common mistakes we see, embarrassing the employee. You want to make sure you find a way that you don't do it in the boardroom when it's the middle of the day and they've got to do have to go through the walk of shame afterwards and walk past all of their colleagues who know exactly what happened. You find a time or a place to have the termination meeting, do it respectfully, and then they can walk out without, without having to walk by all of their colleagues. And another one of my pet peeves, unless you caught them stealing, there is no reason to escort them out like a criminal. You can let them go back to the desk and gather their belongings, say goodbye to people, you can have somebody sort of stay with them if you want to, but you don't have to escort them out of the building, you know, almost looking like they should have handcuffs on. Um, and any of these things can be seen as bad faith. And if a court finds you acting in bad faith, A, you can be obligated to pay more damages, bad faith or moral damages. B, if a judge doesn't like the way you treated the person, there can be cost consequences. And C, and we've seen this recently, even if you have a termination clause, which limits your severance obligations, if a court found that you acted in such a way that you really chose not to be bound by the contract, you lose the benefit of the contract and all of a sudden your severance costs go up. So it costs you again, a whole lot more money to act in bad faith. Number four, lying about the reason for dismissal, even if you're trying to help. 
So I mentioned that the duty of good faith includes honesty. You don't have to give a reason if you let somebody go without cause. But if you do choose to give a reason, do it very carefully. First of all, many times I've had clients who want to be nice. They want to help the person. They don't want to fire the person for cause. So they fire them on a without cause basis. And it's nice and they offer them severance. And then the person turns around and sues them for more severance. And they find out that because they didn't allege cause at the start, they can't allege it now. So there are strategic ways to handle that. But the other thing that I see happen a lot is it's kind of the, the dismissal equivalent of it's not you, it's me, where instead of saying it's because of your performance or something else, you'll say, we've eliminated the position to make the person feel as though it's not their fault. Then the worst thing that you can do is go ahead and fill that position about a week later, because now you lied. That's dishonesty. They can allege bad faith. So even if you want to be nice, there are strategic ways to be nice without misleading them or lying about the reason for termination. And it can lead to additional damages if you do that. Top termination mistake number five, asserting just cause without a legitimate basis. So we all know the threshold for proving just cause is high. If you have a legitimate reason to suspect that the employee engaged in misconduct, you should investigate first before pulling the trigger and terminating. Courts are a lot more understanding if you allege that you had just cause in good faith, even if a court finds that there wasn't just cause because you did it in a reasonable way. Courts are a lot harsher with employers who allege just cause when there's absolutely no legitimate basis to do so, often because they do it just to act uh, to basically engage in hardball and force a person to settle. And if you do that, there will be substantially greater damages awarded. So never allege just cause if there's no legitimate basis for it. Top termination mistake number six, not getting a full and final release. So we all want finality. And if you let somebody go and they don't sign a release, They've got two years to file a claim. So you've got two years of waiting to see what might happen. The way to do that is to get them to sign a full and final release. So the mistake that we often see, A, is either not getting the release or B, getting it, but not giving the person anything in exchange for it. If you just give them what they're legally entitled to and then say you must sign a release, they didn't get anything new in exchange for it. It's not going to be enforceable. So you need to make sure you get the release, make sure it's drafted properly because courts will look for any loophole to help the individual but also give them something in exchange. It's gotta be that quid pro quo or it's not gonna be enforceable. Top termination mistake number seven, not considering ways to help the employee find new work. That might seem a little strange, but I think we have to remember that in most contexts, if the dismissed employee finds new work within the notice period, the severance costs go down. So in other words, if the notice period is six months and they find new work after three, then the former employer's severance costs will be three months. So you should find ways to help this person find new work, especially if they were a good worker and it's just a reorganization or that type of thing. Give them a letter of reference. And this is another pet peeve. The policies that we see of not providing any positive letters of reference because of this mysterious fear of being sued for misrepresentation by giving a positive reference. It doesn't happen in Canada, but you can do yourself a favor by giving them a positive reference and consider outplacement counseling. If you can find a way to get them a job sooner, your severance costs are gonna go down. Top termination mistake number eight, not tracking job opportunities. So this goes along with number seven. If the employee doesn't sign a release and if they do pursue a claim against you, you may wanna argue that they didn't make reasonable efforts to find new work. And it's not as simple as saying as a lot of our clients do, oh, there's lots of jobs out there. And if he or she wanted to be working, they would be. That's not going to do it. You're going to need to produce evidence of jobs that were available, that the person was qualified for, and that if they had applied, there's at least a very good likelihood they would have found something. And if you can produce that evidence, you might actually reduce your severance costs. Um, and frankly, for me acting as counsel, it's a lot of fun when I get to cross-examine someone and put paper after paper in front of them and say, is this a job that you were qualified for? Yes. Was it in a ge geographic area where you could work? Yes. Did you apply? No. What about this one? What about this one? It can be a lot of fun and it just makes a point to them that their case is not as strong as they may have thought, but you need the evidence of the jobs. Top termination tip number nine, not considering potential PR issues. So this harkens back to season five, episode nine of Fire Away, where we talked about the Lisa Laflamme story and how PR can be a very significant consideration in terminations and Bell Media unfortunately for them, is a perfect example of how not to handle the PR side of a termination. So if you think there may be 
a potential public angle to it, think about the PR issues before you terminate the employee. And my number 10 top termination mistake, acting in haste. You know, there's a popular HR expression that you should hire slowly, but fire quickly. And I understand the, the, the notion behind that, but what I'll say is that even if you make the decision to fire quickly, you should take the time to do it properly. Take the time to assess whether you really have just cause. Take the time to assess what the severance obligations are, and then plan for the employee departure. Plan the meeting. Make sure that you protect all of your IT. Make sure you have coverage for the individual. Plan the internal messaging. If there are PR issues, as I mentioned before, consider the external messaging as well, and make sure you have proper dismissal documents ready to go, including a release, as I also mentioned earlier. So that's my number 10, and I'll, I'll throw in a, a bonus uh, top termination mistake, not consulting an HR lawyer. This won't be a shock for anybody who watches Fire Away regularly. There are way too many things that can go wrong in a termination and way too many ways that you can cost yourself far more money than you save by not consulting your HR lawyer before the termination. So if you're considering or planning a dismissal, do yourself a favor, contact an HR lawyer. We'd be happy to help you at Rudner Law, but make sure you do it properly and minimize the risk. So that's all I have for this segment. And thank you for tuning in. Have a great day. That's also all the time we have for season five, episode nine of Fire Away. So I want to thank everyone for tuning in and a really huge thanks to Eric Everbottom for joining me in a great, great discussion about PR and how not to handle terminations that when they're in the public eye. I'll remind everyone that at Rudner Law, we want people to treat their employment relationships as legal relationships and make informed decisions rather than assumptions. I'll invite everyone to keep up to date on employment law issues by following us on Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn, liking our Facebook page, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and also subscribe to our newsletter for employment law updates. But as we always say, none of that replaces legal advice. So if you think you might need an employment lawyer, you probably do. Please feel free to reach out to us and see if we can help. Final reminder that everyone, uh, past episodes can be found on YouTube, on our website, and archived on Facebook. If you like our page or subscribe to our channel, you'll get notifications. Stay tuned for information about our next episode of Fire Away, which will be on November 15th. And last but not least, thanks as always to Rob, Rebecca, and Mark for helping put the show together. Thank you guys for tuning in. See you next time.